Good day, everyone. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes, but I wanted to go over a few logistical items. The session is being recorded and will be made available on our website. Um, for that reason, and due to the sheer number of folks in attendance, your lines have been muted. For questions and comments, we will be using the Q&A feature within Zoom shown on the screen, and we would definitely like to encourage you to use that. So feel free to start typing your questions throughout as they come to mind, and panelists may be answering them writing back throughout. Um, if there is time, we'll select a handful of questions that we'll try to cover at the end of today's seminar. And those Q&A will also be posted with the session materials. We have a handful of panelists that will be sharing their work and knowledge with us today, which we are extremely grateful, not only that they are joining us to share their experiences, but also for the great work they do. So with that, we will go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terry Martin. I'm with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, or NAPSIG. Thank you all for joining us for the third in our Emergency Management EM Geo Forum series. This is a part of a virtual seminar series that we are facilitating on behalf of the Response Geospatial Office within the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We're partnering with them to further a shared vision of advancing emergency management throughout the, throughout the community and the promulgation of best practices and the integration of innovative and technology and solutions in day-to-day -day operations. I'll be introducing our speakers in just a moment, but I did want to mention that we have a few of my NAPSIC teammates that will be helping out today. Paul Doherty, who is also speaking, I'll be introducing him shortly. And Charlotte Abel and Jared Doak will be monitoring the Q&A and kind of keeping us on track. So with that, we're excited that you've all joined us for this topic. We have a jam-packed agenda for you today, so we are going to go ahead and move along. I'd like to turn it over to Chris Vaughn, the Geospatial Information Officer with FEMA, who really had the vision behind the series to get us kicked off on both the topic of tornado readiness uh, that we'll be discussing today, but also on the vision of the EMGO Forum moving forward. So with that, over to you, Chris. Uh, thanks, Terry, and uh, thanks everybody for dialing in. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited about today's session. Um, this month marks my 10 year anniversary here at FEMA. Um, and uh, prior to joining FEMA, I was at uh, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency where we had a whole team dedicated to you know, determining impacts from incidents. And um, um, one of the first events that I really worked was a tornado. It was actually the Joplin, Missouri tornado. And um, I, I was personally awestruck. I was awestruck that we as an agency, as a geospatial community, just didn't really have a lot written down um, related to a tornado. And I remember working with one of our National IMAT unit leaders at the time was Eric Susi, and, and he just did an amazing job of kind of categorizing what our response was from a geospatial perspective, this geospatial game plan uh, following the, the Joplin, Missouri tornado. And um, a couple of things really came out of that is one, we, we really helped to identify and bound the situation. And what I mean by that is how to clarify the incident boundary, right? How to, how to leverage uh, you know, the Storm Prediction Center uh, to get better clarity on where the impacts were. And then how to go inside of, of that with exposure analysis and then ultimately damage assessments. And so uh, we pulled on all of that great work to refine what you're seeing here, right? And obviously over the last 10 years, demonstrable change has occurred within the geospatial community. I mean, you're gonna hear stuff today that literally was a dream about uh, just 10 years ago. You're gonna, we're gonna talk about artificial intelligence. We're gonna talk about 3D imagery. We're gonna talk about how to get early uh, indicators and warnings from folks like the Storm Prediction Center. We're gonna, we're gonna listen and hear uh, from, from uh, great partners out there like the, the JIC and the NICB on how they use imagery to power their insurance um, virtual inspection. So it, today's just gonna be great. I'm so excited for you guys uh, to be a part of it. So thank you for taking the time to join. I'd like to just kind of highlight three big things of where we are headed uh, in response to all of this, right? If, if you can take all of that great science-based information and bound the problem, you can come up with some really quick hitting numbers that drive senior leadership, right? So that's bullet number one. Um, generally speaking, we, we think of those things as like a 
preliminary damage assessment type thing. There's a number of people that do preliminary damage assessment type analysis, but we're focused, relators are focused on delivering that information uh, in a way that it's consumable by senior leadership so they can make decisive actions. And then number two, once you know how bad the impacts are, number two is what are you gonna do about it, right? So we deploy a lot of stuff. We deploy people, things, or money. That's basically what, um, what uh, FEMA does. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can use this technology to, to do better resource allocation. And then the, then the third is obviously this interagency coordination bit. Uh, from a FEMA perspective, a lot of our focus is, is focused on the community lifelines approach, uh, the various different ESFs that are involved in supporting, whether it's power, transportation, health and medical. So um, uh, you're, you're gonna see how we bake all of that into a tornado incident response and recovery operation. And, and once again, what Terry was just talking about is we're really excited about this whole concept of the EM Geo Forum. We're very much uh, taking it from the, the approach of a uh, all hazards uh, game plan, right? So yes, we're, we're focused on a tornado, but once you get past that incident boundary, right, it becomes very much all hazards. So we're going to be iterating on this. Uh, last month, I think, was floods. This month is tornadoes. Next month is going to be hurricanes. So we're going to pick a different um, incident, all in the same vein of refining those top three things that I'm talking about initial situation awareness to leadership that gets better through the course of an incident, resource allocation, and sending people, places, and things, and money out the door, and then that NRHU coordination. So a uh, lot of great speakers lined up for you today. I'm so excited that uh, you know our, our, uh, our, our two colleagues uh, from South Carolina and Mississippi, respectively, uh, are able to join us. Both of them have an amazing story to tell about uh, tornadoes that recently affected their states. Um, let me go to the next slide because I'm talking too long. <laughs> I get excited about this stuff. I do. Uh, so I'm scared. All right. So uh, that is my slide. So I'm going to turn this back over now, please, to uh, Terry. And uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, once again, for, for being a part of this. Thanks so much, Chris. We very much appreciate your vision for the series and supporting everyone that's on the call today. So as you see here, um, this is our agenda. Um, and we'll go into more details to go with everyone listed here. But just briefly, as Chris mentioned, um, we're going to start with building a geospatial game plan with Paul Doherty and then move into some federal resources and workflows with Summer and Maddie. And then finally, we're going to highlight some really great local work with South Carolina and Mississippi from Chad, Rich and Bob. So we're very, very excited that these all uh, tremendous folks have joined us today. So moving on, um, for those of you who might be new to our organization, I'd just like to briefly talk about who we are before we jump in. National Alliance for Public Safety Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit. We have a national network of over 20,000 members, both public safety and GIS practitioners alike, representing local, state, tribal, county levels. We were formed over 10 years ago as an alliance between a number of prominent national associations, some of which you have seen here, um, and evolved into a formal organization over that time. So our vision as an organization is listed here, but at its core is to help build a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome of survivors and really to working towards building a more resilient nation. On the next slide, uh, you'll see a graphic that represents how we work towards that vision. A large part of what we do really culminates in delivering a session like today, sharing resources and lessons learned and encouraging the consistent use of best practices that we've developed, whether um, it's working with mission partners like FEMA and states and locals across the country. And we do that to develop standards and we test them through exercises and sometimes real world disasters. And we continue to refine those based on stakeholder feedback and lessons learned and then provide education and training and resources free to the community and our do tech transfer often through partnerships like what we're doing here today with FEMA, but ultimately with the goal to build capacity of the community. Of course, you can visit our site to get more information and resources moving forward. So today, this uh, is who we have registered for our session. Um, we're very excited to see uh, almost 200 people have registered and it's a really good mix of federal and state and local um, partners, as well as we have a, a very large uh, group of emergency management folks online, um, but a good mix of other fire, public safety, or public works, search and rescue, et cetera. So 
thank you all for joining. We have a pretty good distribution here across the, across the country joining us today. So our objectives for today, um, we really hope that by the end of the session, you'll learn about core information needs for tornado readiness and response. You'll gain an understanding of available tornado predictive products and their timelines. You'll learn about resources for determining and validating the scope and extent of tornado damage and gain insight to how states like Mississippi and South Carolina and locals are using technology to rapidly assess impacts to inform a disaster declaration. And lastly, to understand how to develop a geospatial game plan for your organizations um, and to implement them across all hazards. And that actually brings us to our very first speaker. Hello, oh, good morning Danny. or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Can you hear me all right? <laughs> We can. Thanks so much, Paul. I just want to introduce you. I know everyone on this call already knows you, but um, Paul is the Director of Technology and Innovation for NAPSEG. Among many other things, he has been a biologist, law enforcement search and rescue ranger for Yosemite National Park, an adjunct instructor for Johns Hopkins, a um, advanced academic program where he taught GIS for emergency management. Um, with NAPSEG, he currently focuses on ensuring that the entire public safety community has access to geospatial training and resources needed for their day-to-day -day operations and beyond. And I had to squeeze that in there before you wouldn't let me do your, your bio. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Terry. Well, I'll, um, let's just jump right in. Uh, what are we talking about when we consider a game plan? And I think it really depends on your agency. But uh, we've got some steps here, and this is a story map that we'll share with you to uh, kind of lay out what our concept is, and we're always looking for feedback on this. Um, in order to be prepared for tornadoes, uh, it all really starts with people, right? We need to know who's on our team, and maybe for local government, you're considering your first responders, emergency managers, some of your key local government staff, but you know, you should also be thinking about how does our local weather station fit in, uh, potentially volunteers and VOADs, private sector partners, and of course, the, the GIS specialist plays a critical role in all this. And so I know that seems like a lot of people, but you've got to consider their information needs going into uh, a tornado threat and how you can meet those. And really it requires uh, asking them what they need. So that's kind of the second step is identify what are the core information needs? What are the questions they're going to have for nearly every tornado? And uh, here's just a diagram, but it might start all the way out with forecasting, move into warnings and early reports. We might be getting to collect observations from first responders all the way out to damage assessment and, and into recovery. And it's a lot of information, if you think about it, to either put on a map or to even know where to find it. And so we're trying to help uh, at NAPSIG lay out some best practices for doing this. And so this is my first time using the, uh, the new story map. And uh, I made a little slideshow here. And what we've done is we use an example from April uh, in South Carolina. And you're gonna hear more about this example from Chad in, uh, in a little bit. But um, you know, starting way out um, in your forecast range, uh, you, know, you might be looking at graphics like this from the SPC, um, from the National Weather Service. And that's a pretty good indication that they think that there will be some sort of uh, tornado or very severe weather coming up. And while that's a graphic, it actually is a layer in ArcGIS Online that you can pull into your maps. And I'll show you a little bit what that looks like soon. But this is what it looked like uh, the day before the tornadoes hit in South Carolina. You could see they were in an enhanced threat zone. Um, the next thing is, you know, as you're getting closer, uh, there'll be imminent threats. And a lot of you are familiar with IPAWS and common alerting, um, but these are actually layers as well. And the Weather Service makes these available as a live feed that you can also have on your maps. So this is archived just for South Carolina. And, you know, I like to archive these or pull them up because it really gives you an idea of uh, where did they think tornadoes were going to happen and where do they actually occur. Um, so again, another wherever you see source you'll be able to find the source for the live feed um, in the maps that i'm showing as we move in uh, we're going to focus today on seneca uh, a, a town in south carolina but you can see these new icons popping up on the map and those are observations uh, i believe from the skywarn storm spotter sy system and that's also a live feed that you could have in your map ahead of time and these are just uh, estimated locations of where tornado damage has already occurred. And it's really useful uh, during an emerging incident. From there, 
I think a lot of local governments might have a gap and they may not know what to do next. And hopefully they're getting information from their local National Weather Service office. Um, one tool that we've looked at at NAPSIG and realized that it's, uh, it I still think it requires expertise is the MRMS system. And I think uh, Richard actually pointed this out to me and he'll talk a little bit to it, but it's a way to just see where there was tornadic activity according to the sensor system. And it's not a live feed in ArcGIS, so I'm not gonna show it to you here today, but it is a website that uh, is a tool, but I believe it requires training and much rather you just work with your local weather service to uh, have them tell you where they think tornadoes have occurred. And then there's, you know, un, maybe less conventional means of uh, assessing where tornadoes occurred. We've partnered with the GIS Corps more recently, and they've been mapping social media photos so that you could not just look at a Twitter feed to see all the damages, they'll actually try to put it on a map to add context really, because it can become overwhelming um, during an incident to understand where all these photos are coming from. And then next, uh, as you, if you know me well, this is my favorite, is you know, geo-enabling first responders. If first responders are going out and doing life-saving and welfare checks and moving into their, their primary search, why not give them a tool so that they can mark their observations as they go? It helps them with situational awareness, and it also helps you as an emergency manager understand uh, what they're seeing out in the field and as we'll talk a little bit about later, you might even get a jump on your initial damage assessment if you partner with first responders in this way. And we'll hear more about that from Chad. Um, hopefully next for you is you're gonna get some support from overhead, whether that is a local sensor on a drone or a small aircraft, or you're partnering with organizations like GIC or others to, uh, to get some post-event imagery. But we think this is always gonna play a role in the comprehensive process of assessing damage in tornadoes. And Richard's gonna speak a little bit to his process uh, a little later today, but uh, here's just an example from Seneca and uh, how, how easy it is to see damage from overhead in a situation like this. But you're gonna hear some other things that you may not even know exist. And personally, this was new for me. I had no idea that the Oak Ridge National Lab I uh, was partnering with federal agencies to model the potential impacts using preliminary storm tracks. And you'll hear more, a little more about this from Maddie in just a bit. Um, many of you might be familiar with, uh, especially on Twitter, that the National Weather Service will share their preliminary damage assessment, which is really about the tornado itself. That's actually a layer you can have in your map ready to go. Um, and we've indexed that in our toolkit. They'll typically map at least the track and you'll see their points, which are their field damage assessments. And occasionally they'll put in uh, swaths as well. But what we're really trying to work towards after the life saving is done is, you know, what's the overall damage to communities? And there's a lot in this space and we've had whole webinars on damage assessment. But I think the most important thing is to recognize that you need a plan to lead up to that, right? And if we take all this geospatial information and think about it in terms of a timeline and the audience, I think if you have that set up in advance, you're going to be a lot more successful. And, um, you know, damage assessment is, of course, a, uh, a topic, a complex topic. It really does start with first responders on the ground and moves to multiple agencies. And the more you have these plans in place, the better you're going to be able to uh, respond and recover to tornadoes. So that's just uh, kind of a quick summary of what we've got here. Everything I showed you, we put some resources together uh, in this story map so you can begin to get started on this approach yourself. And um, since we're here, let's just see what's going on. Um, in the next 24 to 48 hours, there are some SBC outlooks. Um, in a story map like this, I can quickly tab through the layers so they're not all on in one map. Uh, doesn't look like there's any imminent threats, so that's good news. We can participate in the webinar. Um, but this is a way to kind of bring data together and story maps are just an example of how to do that in a way that might be a little less uh, overwhelming. So with that, I believe I'll turn it back to Terry. Great. Thank you, Paul. I, I kid him because uh, I'm skipping his part because he's so humble. But this concept of the geospatial game plan has really taken hold and helped us to focus our efforts on how to how the geospatial community at large can prepare so thank you and we'll see the different parts that paul discussed with each of our panelists starting with dr summer erickson 
a meteorologist by trade. Dr. Erickson has spent over 15 years bridging the gap between meteorology, communications, and emergency management. During her tenure in emergency management, she has provided interpretations of meteorological, hydrological, and climatological analysis and provided decision support for senior leadership and partners. And for the past six years, Dr. Erickson implemented and serves as the inaugural FEMA liaison to sports prediction, or sports, <laughs> Store Prediction Center, located in Norman, Oklahoma. Welcome, Dr. Erickson. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for that introduction. I appreciate uh, your time today, and I'm very happy to be a part of this forum. Um, I'm very excited about the topics that will be discussed and uh, what has been discussed and what will be discussed. So just to start with, I'll give you a brief overview. Um, the programs that we have we, we have, we have a handful of meteorologists that work for the agency. Um, some actually do meteorological positions and some are, are otherwise. And so the meteorological positions that we actually have, we, we initially started uh, a FEMA liaison at the National Hurricane Center, Matthew Green, about 15 years ago. Um, and so he's been working with the hurricane program down there from Miami, Florida. Um, and then about six years ago, we uh, did implement the Storm Prediction Center liaison to assist with the tornadic activity because we were lacking in the area, as Chris mentioned, um, not only within GIS um, of, of tornado tracking, but also just of situational awareness of tornadoes and severe weather in general. So this position has been here for six years and then the National Water Center is actually in the process, we are in the process of uh, working towards hiring a liaison to be stationed in Tuscaloosa, Alabama with the Water Center as well. So that will be coming on board hopefully within the next six months. Um, we're looking forward to having that person on it as well. And so we work closely with uh, each other as well as uh, in addition to the NOAA liaison to FEMA headquarters who resides uh, at, at, uh, at, in Washington, D.C. at the headquarters office there. So we all work together to support and we're continuing to grow these, these programs. But um, that's just a little kind of background of, uh, of a liaison program in general. Turning to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what it is that I do, the FEMA liaison uh, to the Storm Prediction Center. So I enhance communication, visual, visualization, and dissemination of, of information and data between the SPC, FEMA, and partners. So you may have some of those reports that I send out, which I'll talk briefly about here in a minute. I also support FEMA posture readiness regarding severe weather preparations and response operations. So I work closely with senior leadership um, our state directors, some of our locals, some of our federal partners, and even private and uh, non and nonprofit entities to assist with any type of severe weather uh, preparedness and posturing in terms of before, during, and after events. So I do both. And then uh, enhanced GIS, which is really what we're here today about, is enhanced GIS data capabilities for severe weather analysis including those pre post event impact and damage assessments. So um, for the past six years, the first goal I had when I got here was to really uh, get the data where it needed to be. Because when I started here six years ago, the data was not exactly in the, in the format. It was not easily accessible and things like that. So we've worked really hard to get that into place with the Storm Prediction Center. In addition, we have worked to um, get some additional resources available for GIS, um, in particular, the, the preliminary uh, tornado tracks that I'll also mention on the next slide here in just a minute. Um, but we've been instrumental in working with myself and GIS, as well as the National Weather Service and Storm Prediction Center to get those available to you. Uh, develop and conducting weather training, I do that several times a year, and I support planning, develop scenarios and exercises. Um, so certainly a big part of the role that I play, participating in partner meetings, workshops, of course. And then in general, I, I serve as sort of a, a point of contact for weather info requests from the field or the region. So sometimes personnel don't always know who to go to when we're looking for weather information. There's a lot of information and resources available out there. And it can be a little bit hard to uh, you know, know where to go or who to call for what types of information. So I often serve as the person that a lot of folks will call, uh, particularly within FEMA, and I will be able to either get that information for them or direct them to the appropriate entity that would be able to provide that information to them. Uh, looking to the next slide, um, I'll talk a little bit more in depth about um, what it is I'm doing, the information that's available, how this all works. So I'm always monitoring these threats 24-7, 365, because severe weather unfortunately never stops. Um, we do have peak season, which typically lasts between March um, through July, but unfortunately it does happen year round. So I'm always on my toes monitoring what's coming up next and informing and sending out those 
reports. I am participating in the daily FEMA headquarters briefing, which you may or may not uh, hear or receive, but you all are of ability to do so. And then these reports that I mentioned earlier for the Storm Prediction Center products we have available, we have the, as, uh, as was previously shown, we have the uh, forecast, which actually day one, day two, and day three um, we have, and then we actually have a day four through eight as well. But those particular ones that were mentioned, um, I'm sending all of that information out um, through my distribution list to help people with situation awareness so they know when things might be coming up so that GIS is prepared to possibly be able to support and maybe even map things ahead of time. Um, so that's part of what I do. And then in addition to the reports, I also have, um, and for the day one, two, and days one and two, we also have um, forecasts for tornadoes, wind, and hail. So that helps. So while the day one, two, and three forecasts are categorical, which he showed between a marginal to a high risk, um, we also have uh, type hazards for tornadoes, wind, and hail. And that can be really helpful, um, particularly in my position. I convey that so that people know that it's a moderate risk, for example, but it's not for tornadoes, it's for large hail, which may or may not be as important to you and, and your role. So those that's a, a highly important piece that I'm able to convey to all of you. And then in addition, we also have uh, watches, storm, severe thunderstorm and tornado. I pass those along. We do have particularly dangerous situations, um, which means we either have potential for a tornado outbreak with high-end tornadoes or a derecho event, which is a long-lived wind event with high damaging wind. So uh, in addition, we do have, I do a lot of other things, but those are the situational awareness pieces I generally provide in addition to monitoring any tornado warnings and trying to pass them along as well. Um, and in coordination, regional partner briefings, GIS support, leadership briefings, NRCC response. Um, so GIS support is the other point I wanted to highlight, um, and that is going back to those preliminary tracks that we worked on uh, six years ago and are now available to at least FEMA internally. Um, we do provide that information to them within an hour or so of an event, and a lot of the weather service, local weather service offices do provide that also to state and locals as well. So if you're state and local, um, local weather service offices are the ones that provide that um, to you all, and if you're FEMA, then uh, those, that information is provided um, to me or, or to you particularly, depending on, on your role. Um, but you have access to it and you'll know how to have access to it. So if you're FEMA internal, you'll need to contact me in order to get that access. But if you're GIS within FEMA, you know where to get that. So just to highlight again, that has really been in a, a really important in part of what we have been working on um, to get that in place to really help with some of that analysis and really, you know, being able to decide, make decisions early on. Um, and then that graphic just kind of describes a little bit of the information that um, I'm looking for and what people are requesting um, from the SBC when I'm, you know, sending out my reports, when I'm trying to decide who to get what and at what time frame. So just to kind of reiterate uh, a few of those um, highlights. And then on the next uh, last slide here is just a, a little bit of the value. Um, why are we kind of doing this? We are doing this to um, be proactive, right? We're, we typically been reactive prior to um, several years ago. So we're looking to be more proactive in disaster support and response timely, uh, have that timely posted that analysis so that we know as soon as we can what the situation is, certainly make more cost effective operations and decisions, uh, refine targeted preparedness response, enhancing that planning and preparedness. Again, expanding the outreach. I've encountered a lot of folks who don't um, fully understand what severe weather entails and how this works. And so I do a lot of outreach and training with our partners and the public and supporting a response strategy, advancement and adapt response tactics. So um, that's really just the uh, over, a brief overview of the uh, FEMA liaison to the Storm Prediction Center's role and how this works. And this is just a, a note to kind of end on just to give you a thought. This was a uh, National Weather Service director from 1971 uh, stated this quote, and I think it's really poignant that what he was stating back then was just that uh, the National Weather Service was improving their forecast and people uh, were still, you know, perishing and they were unable to, um, and property was still being damaged. And so he realized then that emergency management and in this context, GIS and a lot, uh, you know, uh, life and property saving would really rely on emergency management in general. So that's what I'll leave you with pending any questions. Thank you so much, Summer. We can tell you have a real passion for meteorology, which is a good thing since you work uh, on or on call for 24-7, 365, and we're all very grateful uh, for your dedication, so thank you. And a, a lot of the work we know that you do um, and the work of the Storm Center um, directly feeds into the analysis conducted by our next presenter. Um, so we're, we're going to hear from Madeline Jones next, who is a geophysical data scientist with New Light Technologies out of Washington, D.C. 
She currently leads NLT's team in support of FEMA's Response Geospatial Office, where she develops hazard models and mapping tools to aid FEMA with predicting disaster impacts in near real time. So over to you, Maddie. Hi, thanks, Terry. Um, I am speaking briefly today on behalf of the team to talk about some of the tornado response products and resources that FEMA RGO provides during uh, following a significant tornado event. Um, so within FEMA's response geospatial office, we've developed some analytical models and tools to automate slash expedite the preliminary damage assessment process using best available at the time geospatial data. Um, and I've broken these products into two categories. So on the left, you'll see the geoanalytics and on the right is remote sensing. Um, so the geoanalytics category, which I'll dive into in just a second, um, includes automatically processing uh, authoritative and event specific data, which is available in the form of live feeds and services, and then making any model outputs and situational awareness tools publicly available via web apps and dashboards. And then in the remote sensing category, we also have many capabilities that involve collecting and processing satellite or aerial imagery, but these workflows obviously require there to be some kind of imagery acquisition or mission assignment following the tornado. Um, so to start, I'm going to talk first about the geoanalytics category, which includes the tornado damage assessment model. Um, this is a Python script that uses three key components. The first is parcel data and land use information that tells you about what kind of structure might be present, such as a single family residence or a high rise apartment or a farm or a hospital, et cetera. Um, the second component is the National Weather Services Damage Assessment Toolkit. This is a public feed where authoritative tornado survey data is collected and disseminated. So this model in particular uses the tornado path polygons that have the enhanced Fujita or EF rating associated with them. Um, and from the EF rating, you can get the wind speed range. So these two data sets feed into the third component, which are the damage functions. Um, based on the degrees of damage and the damage indicators that the EF ratings were developed from. So it's essentially a lookup table that we've generated that tells you what level of damage could potentially be expected for different structure types that are uh, hit by a tornado um, at various wind speeds. So the output of this model is a point on structure or a point on parcel um, predicted damage assessment of affected, minor, major, or destroyed. And the model outputs are provided through the Tornado Incident Journal, which is a public facing story map intended to be used for situational awareness. Um, I was going to share a link of the journal, but I think for the sake of time here, I'll just kind of talk through. Um, but essentially the first page is a, a live overview of uh, real time tornado and severe storm data feeds, as well as, as you kind of scroll through the story map, there's a page of estimated population impacts and building impacts for each tornado path polygon um, that's provided through the National Weather Service's feed. Um, oh yeah, here we go. So if you click on um, like the fourth one down, the Polk tornado in Iowa, it'll actually zoom over to the tornado and then the little widgets at the bottom of the dashboard will update with the estimated number of structures within each damage category. So as this live tornado data feed is updated through the National Weather Services, we're sort of running the model in the background and updating um, the dashboards and widgets in the story map. And um, from here, you can just go back to the, to the PowerPoint. Thank you. Um, and I'll include links on my last slide of where you can access um, the story map and other resources here. But moving into the remote sensing category, if there is a Sentinel-2 scene collected before and quickly after the tornado, our team can generate a tornado path polygon using change detection. Um, and in some case studies, this output that you can see here, the, the sort of green tornado path, um, can actually be a little more accurate than the hand-drawn tornado path polygon that's provided through the National Weather Service. Um, we're working now to incorporate some kind of damage proxy associated with the amount of change in the pixels 
Um, but we're currently in the validation stage of this work, but for now we're able to pretty quickly and accurately generate a tornado path polygon using Sentinel-2 before and after imagery. Um, and then additionally, if a tornado event involves a mission assignment for Civil Air Patrol to collect 3D imagery over the area of impact, FEMA's partners such as Oak Ridge National Labs or companies such as Skyline and GeoX have the capabilities to produce damage assessments using AI and the 3D imagery. Um, and all of these data sets can be converted into services and compiled into event-specific 2D or 3D viewers. Um, and then there's one more link here of the 3D viewer for the Onalaska, Texas tornado that took place on April 22nd, 2020. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be able to get the link up, but if not, that's okay because we can share it at the end. Oh, nice. Okay, so I'll kind of narrate. Um, if you hover your mouse over the little overview buttons on the bottom and then click on the left one, it should zoom in. Perfect. Yeah, and so this is just an example of one viewer that can hold the 2D imagery, the 3D imagery, the damage assessments, as well as the Sentinel-2 derived tornado path polygon. Um, and the quality of the 3D imagery is really great. Thank you. Yeah, so switching back to the PowerPoint, um, you can go to my next slide here. Everything I've discussed is publicly available and can be found on FEMA's ArcGIS online site. Um, if you go to fema.maps.arcgis.com, you can also access our hub site here and do a search for tornado products. You can go to the FEMA Mapping and Analysis Center's content to see what kind of event-specific products have been produced. Um, and then you can also visit any of our incident journals um, really quickly from going to disasters.geoplatform.gov. And if you look at the bottom of the image there, there's an incident journal for hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, tornadoes, and wildfires. Um, and then there's just one more slide with my information. If anyone has any specific questions, oh, I thought this was my information. <laughs> I'll put my info in the chat. Um, if anyone has any specific questions, there it is. Um, about any of the models or data that I discussed today. Thank you. Great. Madeline and her team do uh, a tremendous job supporting the FEMA Response Geospatial Office. It's always very interesting to hear the things you all are working on and learn about the new data and imagery sources you all are leveraging to run your model. So thank you, Maddie, for sharing. Um, please add your questions that you have for Maddie or Summer to the Q&A. We will try and address them at the end of the hour. Next, we have our two local examples. Um, first, we'll hear from Chad Beam. Chad is another member in the community that we've had a chance to work with quite a lot over the years. Chad has been in emergency services since 2005 and currently serves as a section chief over firefighter mobilization for the state of South Carolina. And within his office, he oversees firefighter mobility, the South Carolina Task Force One, and the South Carolina Helicopter Aquatic Rescue Team. Along with Chad, we will hear from Rich Butkerite, another close member of the NAPSIG community. Richard is the Director of, of Cat Catastrophe Response at the Geospatial Intelligence Center. Uh, Richard began this position in November of 2018, coming from 12 years with the Florida Division of Emergency Management, where he served as the Chief Information Officer for the Division and Technical Services Branch Chief for the Florida State Emergency Response Team. They were uh, they're going to talk with us about how they've collaborated in recent events. So I'll turn it over to you, Chad. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I really appreciate your time and uh, appreciate you asking us to be a part of this. So real quick, I just want to kind of uh, share our story and what we've done recently. Um, South Carolina has never been a notorious um, tornado state, but as of today, we've had 42 confirmed tornadoes in our state. And so uh, we, we're quickly becoming uh, there, I guess. So um, on April 13th, we had 23 tornadoes touch down. Uh, throughout the day, it was a, a statewide outbreak, and um, state, our firefighter mobilization program was requested that Monday morning to respond to Pickens County and Oconee County uh, for some co uh, confirmed tornado touchdowns, uh, which ended up being a couple EF2 and 3s up in that area. And so Seneca, which Paul talked about earlier, was the 
main area of operation that uh, turned out to be for that week for us. And so a regional rescue team was sent that morning um, to Seneca to, to start the operation. We have five regional rescue teams around the state and then the, the statewide type one urban search and rescue team. And uh, we use our regional teams, they get there and kind of get started. And then um, if it escalates into something larger, we move the uh, type one team up there or a contingent if needed. So our regional team got up there that morning and started operating uh, with survey one, two, three, and just doing uh, basic damage assessments wh like what we normally do in the USAR world. So uh, back in the older days of USAR, of course, we used to paint structures and um, then we went to labeling stickers and now we do it with GIS technology using, uh, we utilize survey one, two, three for our, um, our platform to do this. So uh, this goes on that day and then a type three urban search and rescue team was requested uh, to go to Seneca. So um, we did that that Tuesday morning. The main mission was to do a um, structure stabilization assessment and uh, complete any other uh, damage assessment, um, USAR damage assessment that was not completed the day before. And of course, remedy any type of hazard we came in contact with up to uh, providing life safety for any trapped residents. Uh, next, please. So, like I said, uh, South Carolina Task Force One, um, we sent out the notification that Monday and at uh, 0400 Tuesday on the 14th, we uh, sent up the Type 3 team uh, consisting of 35 members and a full USAR component of, of cash equipment. And we began, we began the um, full search and urban search and rescue damage assessment that morning, which continued throughout that day. Um, and again, this was completed using survey one, two, three. And so I think that probably one of the most important things about uh, to, to really harp on is it gives us real time data in the command post. And below you'll see right there in the, in the command post, we had the county emergency manager, city administrator, county administrator, all the local fire chiefs, um, task force leaders, and the EMD reps from um, our state e EOC. All of these people in one room looking at one dashboard for multiple sources of information coming in. And of course, um, with with the platform that we use, Survey123, it gives us uh, the ability to shoot the pictures with it too. So here we have all of our government officials and decision makers standing in one room looking at real-time data coming in, pictures associated with it, and it really helped jumpstart the, uh, the official damage assessment for the community. And you can go ahead and go to the next one, Paul. And so this became uh, a very successful operation. And after the completion of the USAR mission that Monday and Tuesday, the local building code official for the city of Seneca really wanted to keep utilizing that method and that, that platform for completing their damage assessment. So the local building official got in touch with our assistant state fire marshal that's over um, codes and enforcement. And together they worked with the um, South Carolina Building Codes Official Association, and they mobilized some local uh, building code officials from all across the state, came to Seneca, and then through firefighter mobilization, we brought in uh, a couple uh, uh, regional departments in the area each day. And every morning we would meet with them and send them out. And for the, re the rest of that week, we completed that mission on that Friday we were able to do the entire damage assessment, which uh, Paul showed a, a snapshot of it earlier in his presentation. And again, we're, we're getting real time data, uh, the local and county officials, decision makers, financial decision makers, every, everybody's in one room looking at all this data. We, we provided them all with links to the dashboard. So if they had to go somewhere else to a meeting, they could keep kind of tabs on this. And so we were able to do a complete damage assessment with GIS data. Now, why, why is that important? Because um, instead of just coming back with a, a clipboard and some paper, we had data on a dashboard that gave us an idea of size of uh, track because we associated within our map the data from the National Weather Service. And so we could see what kind of what was predicted to, to you know, be damaged, uh, where the damage was. And because we were using um, GIS data with this, we actually found some outlying uh, damage points. And then we did a flyover and found two more tornadoes that um, touched down the area that were not initially reported. So that was from our USAR guys that were initially out in the field and then followed up by the um, official damage assessment. Again, utilizing the GIS um, data, it was just a major success for us. So, 
Um, we actually were requested by our state emergency management office to go down to another county in our state that weekend that had an EF4 touchdown, uh, which was the first EF4 in the low country of our state um, ever. And we did their entire county damage assessment using this platform and using first responders and our USAR folks. Um, so USAR teams utilizing, I have sur survey one, two, three, but GIS in, in general for the initial damage assessment is just a major win because it's gonna give you the preliminary data needed to complete the official damage assessment afterwards. We were actually able to meet with the FEMA folks when they came in and give them our data. So they had it as a, um, a backup and kind of a, a, uh, um, a tool to kind of check against theirs and see if anybody missed anything. And it was just a really good operation for us. It was a really good uh, proof of uh, incorporating technology into uh, urban search and rescue and turning that data over to your officials to complete the official damage assessment later. Um, a, a huge thing we found was we were able to do a lot of work that didn't have to be repeated. And in the past, it's been repeated multiple times. So that was, uh, that was our use of it and um, a, a major success. Uh, we're kind of rewriting the way South Carolina does damage assessments now. And we've worked with our state uh, PA folks and, and talked with our FEMA region four folks. And I think we're gonna be able to move forward with this in the future. And uh, hopefully we don't have to use it again this year, but we've already had, like I said, 42 tornadoes and one tropical storm make landfall yesterday. So I would imagine we're gonna use it uh, a few more times this year. Um, but if, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We, we'd love to share our, our success story and our, uh, what we do to help get the guys trained um, just in time to get them out. And um, if we can be of any assistance to anybody, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you so much. All right, hey, this is Richard, and I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, the GIC and uh, what we can do to help out with our support of what we call the Gray Sky Program. Next slide. So what the GIC is, is it's an initiative by the National Insurance Crime Bureau who partnered with Vexel Imaging to create the GIC, which is a consortium of insurance companies. Uh, many of the homeowners uh, policies that uh, you know, many of us have, you'll find that these companies are members of our consortium. And what we're doing is uh, flying both blue sky aerials, which we provide back to the insurers, and uh, the gray sky program. We're uh, you know, responding to events and capturing these imagery, out, imagery after fires, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, even some floods, and providing that back to the insurers. And as part of the partnership uh, that we built here, we provide no cost access to this imagery to public safety stakeholders, including first responders, emergency management, local, state, and federal government. Next slide. So what are some of the events we responded to? We're gonna go through these pretty quick, but I just wanted to give you a graphic of, you know, back in 2017, we responded to a couple of hurricanes. Here's the events in 18, next slide. The events in uh, 2019, next slide. And now up to 2020, and you can see several uh, <coughs> tornadoes here in the last couple of months. Uh, we actually did do the uh, collected imagery over the Midland Michigan flood. It's not on the slide because it just happened. <laughs> um, and when, like I say, whenever we uh, make the decision on the behalf of the interest of our insurers to fly these events, then we're able to share that imagery back out to our public safety stakeholders. Next slide. So what's driving us? It's all about damage to insured structures and a density of that damage. We do have a threshold in mind. We need at least 100 damaged or destroyed structures, uh, business or um, residential and or residential before we can, uh, you know, pull the trigger on our end. But uh, I kind of didn't get it on the slide, but we also, you know, have to consider the population affected and a density of this. So, you know, some of the events today, like uh, the tornadoes in uh, Mississippi, we did not respond. I know that there were severe damage in, in, in small areas, or at large areas, I should say, 
but the, uh, you know, the affected population and the number of insured structures in those areas, you know, we would have been flying for days to get um, all of that area covered. So uh, it is a play for us between uh, the extent of damage and the concentration of damage and the population and policies affected, which really drive our decision making. So uh, to meet those thresholds, you know, and how do we get to there? We're, we're constantly monitoring some of the same things that we've talked about today. Um, we're using uh, rotation tracks from MMRS radar, but I'm not a meteorologist, so I don't do that very well. Uh, we use the um, social media uh, photographs that uh, NAPSIG talked about earlier, that Paul talked about. That's definitely a, a form we use. We can use Google traffic maps. Uh, the screen capture right there is of a local damage assessment from a uh, initial damage assessment from an emergency manager in South Carolina. And uh, before there was National Weather Service damage assessment uh, survey, we were able to take those points and delineate our area of interest. Next slide. <clears throat> but after we get the uh, data from the National Weather Service, you can see we were right on with our area of interest. So all of those can come together. I think there's nothing that's any better. <laughs> uh, you know, the gold standard truly is some initial damage assessments from the National Weather Service to help us inform uh, where and when we may fly. You know, we're watching the watches and the warnings and that's all in the outlooks and telling us where things may happen. But we really need that detailed what actually did happen, what, what damage did occur on the ground to help us pull the trigger. Next slide. So how can, how can you access the GIC imagery? It's available as ArcGIS REST and WMTS services. If you're in FEMA and you have access to fema.maps.arcgis.com, you already have access to our uh, gray sky imagery. You can just search in those portals for NICB or GIC, I think works. I haven't verified that. I know NICB does. And then you have access to our gray sky imagery services and you can pull those into your maps and go to go to town with that. For local and state, <clears throat> you can uh, sign up uh, to receive, uh, be joined to a, a listserv and at geointel.org slash free disaster imagery there. You can also e email us directly at grayscott.geointel.org or follow us on our social media where we're publishing uh, whenever we do collect this data and make it available. So that's real quick introduction to us and how to get in touch with us. And uh, not going to go into more details here today, uh, but certainly we can, um, you know, reach out to us if you have any questions at those contacts. Okay. That's it. All right. Thank you, uh, Chad and Richard, for sharing that story. And, and just to kind of tie the two together, uh, between the work that was done on the ground by the search and rescue teams and the uh, GIC imagery, uh, we were able to partner with the GIS Corps to actually take some of the, the points that had been collected. Um, this was a new system for some of the firefighters and maybe their points weren't exactly on the buildings. By using the imagery from above, like we talked about uh, with GIC and the imagery from the ground, it was very easy to, uh, I shouldn't say easy, it's time consuming, but very uh, simple to simply move a point to the correct uh, house that's been damaged and a really nice way to see different data sets coming together and, and uh, really appreciate the GIS Corps' help on that and it certainly helped the local county there. With that, I believe I will hand it back to Terry who's going to get us back on track here and, and take us to the next speaker. Thank you uh, to Chad, Richard, and Paul. I know, yes, we are running a little bit low on time, so I do want to hand it quickly over to Bob Busek, the Chief Information Officer with the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency. Bob has quite an extensive and esteemed and lengthy career. So, but I did want to at least mention before I hand it over to him um, that prior to Mima, um, Busek served 10 years in the U.S. Army and Mississippi National Guard, serving numerous roles and as a combat veteran of Iraqi Freedom One and Three. With uh, that, I'll hand it over to you, Bob. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it was interesting to see what South Carolina's been doing. <clears throat> I just wanted to point out a few things and then I'm going to paint a picture of what happened uh, here recently at our Easter storms. In 2019, we had 115 tornadoes and you can see in April, uh, we had 67. 
Um, if you, uh, we have three fatalities in 2019, if you flip to the next slide for me, please. Uh, 2020 has been very interesting. Uh, we've are, had 32 tornadoes. We had 14 deaths. Uh, April 12th, Easter storms. That's about the same time that Carolina storms happened. You know that that front came through and it did a lot of major major damage. Uh, <clears throat> we recently, in the last two years, uh, moved to a new damage assessment platform called Crisis Track. Um, we previous to that had done it on paper, and then we had used the Collector app, which is an Esri product. And we, we were not really getting a lot of buy-in from the local EMAs. Mississippi is made up of 82 counties, plus the band of Choctaw Indians, and count them as a uh, 83rd county. And with Crisis Track, we are at 75 counties right now that are participating in the program. And uh, the remaining counties either have no geospatial data or, or they don't have GIS departments, and we're working through getting them converted to digital data. Uh, so back to the Easter storm. Uh, <clears throat> The Easter storms came. We had uh, 12 uh, tornadoes that hit immediately. There were 15 tornadoes of fatality. Uh, two of them were record-setting tornadoes. One of them was 90 miles long, was the first or the, the number one record-setting largest tornado at two and a half miles wide in Mississippi history, and the third uh, on record for the United States. It was very, very large. There's a picture of it. You can kind of see some of the damage there. Um, Obviously, you know, uh, as soon as we could get to it, we started our damage assessment process with our crisis track tool. Um, our emergency management uh, directors for each county have access to this program. Uh, the state purchased it in association with our Mississippi Insurance Department. We gave it to the counties at no cost to them. We've trained them up on it over the last couple of years, and then boom, this, this big storm happened. And uh, they go out, they do their assessments, and they, you know, in Crisis Track, they're able to collect, uh, you know, information, pictures, video. Uh, we take the tax parcel information from the county tax assessors and load it into Crisis Track. So when they get on the scene, if there is a slab, there's no longer a house, uh, it geolocates and it gives them the, the 10 closest address addresses. And then from that, they can delineate. This used to be 125 Macomb Avenue or whatever, and they can start their damage assessment process. While all of that was going on, uh, Mississippi has been working towards using uh, aerial platforms to be able to do damage assessments. We've been working towards the artificial intelligence add-ons and enhancements that have been going on. We were in the process of working through uh, working with Chris Vaughn at at FEMA on some, some new processes trying to stay on the bleeding edge of, of what is happening in the emergency management and disaster uh, assistance and assessment processes, uh, we were able to get uh, the Civil Air Patrol to strap on a really cool camera uh, from Waldo Air, and they flew the large tornado track in the Hattiesburg area that covered Susco, Matthews, and Moss, and they basically flew the same path that we had already done boots on the ground assessment so that we could see what this artificial intelligence could do to step up our game from disaster uh, assistance and so on and so forth. And so uh, they did fly over the area. Uh, it took them about three hours. They landed at the Jackson Airport. We uploaded the data. And 24 hours later, we were looking at 3D aerial imagery of uh, the area. It was it was interesting to see the, the devastation that was done to these local areas. Um, from a geek speak, you know, side, uh, looking at the data that come off of that imagery and comparing it to our boots on the ground assessment, light years uh, of difference. And so there, there's some training things that we're going to go through uh, to, to better get the AI to recognize some things. But we learned a lot from that, and we are stepping up our game in Mississippi when it comes to the damage assessment process, and uh, I will be open to any questions or, uh, you know, helping anyone out in, in what we are doing here in Mississippi, but I, I really see AI being a huge advancement in, uh, you know, emergency management as we see it right now and as we move forward. So I appreciate you having me today. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And I'd like to echo uh, how important it is to continue innovating and, and getting better and faster at this damage assessment. 
the, uh, the incidents are only getting more complex and more frequent. So thank you uh, to all of our speakers. Um, we are running up to the end here. So I want to just make you aware of some of the resources that will be shared out with the slides. Um, one of the key things that we're providing from NAPSIG's end is the Tornado Geospatial Game Plan Story Map. We are also working on a PowerPoint template that you can look at now um, to help you build out your geospatial game plan. It just provides some uh, framework for you to maybe start having that conversation with your team. And we are looking for feedback on if that's helpful. So far, we've gotten really positive feedback, but just trying to help people get started is usually the, uh, the hardest part. As far as uh, what's next, we uh, looks like a poll is popping up. We would like to know a little bit about what hazard uh, you would like to hear about next as far as a game plan. If we were to develop more materials uh, like this webinar, but also the story map you saw, uh, what would be your choice? And is everybody seeing the poll? All right, we've got 59 responses. I'll let you continue to fill that out and we'll come back and revisit that in a bit. And we really appreciate your feedback on that. So again, the, uh, the geospatial game plan here, just a snapshot of what that looks like. Uh, highly encourage you to download that PowerPoint. You can comment on the ArcGIS online item on feedback or just send us a note at uh, admin at publicsafetygis.org. And with that, I'd like to just turn it to Terry for next steps. Great, thank you. And thanks to all of our panelists today. We're always so lucky and fortunate to have such great speakers um, with us for these seminars. I know we covered a lot and we will be posting all the materials uh, that you saw today, um, as well as some resources that our panelists have shared with us that they would like you all to have access to that we didn't have time to go into detail on. So all the links and and guidance that they spoke to and how to access the different materials that they spoke about will all be on our events page. So we do have a, another EM Geoforum coming in June. Um, that will be on hurricanes. So look for information to that. Um, you can always check back on our events page. Uh, everything gets posted there. Um, moving on to the next slide, I wanted to mention uh, we partner with the Modeling and Data Working Group, the MDWG. If you're not familiar, you can sign up to receive information from them and when they meet. They do uh, monthly sessions as well. And we work together to, uh, you know, all of these topics are kind of difficult and comprehensive. So we work together and in tandem on uh, different topics. So they will be doing uh, their upcoming topic on hurricanes and we will build off of what they uh, communicate in that seminar. So I encourage you to uh, subscribe uh, to um, their uh, Gov delivery and they, and they will get information on, on their next session. Um, with that, I know we are over, we're at three of two. Uh, so Jared, do we have any final questions for our panelists that we need to cover? Or were they all covered in the Q&A feature? Our panelists did a great job of uh, answering in the Q&A feature and there are no outstanding questions, thanks. Wonderful, and the Q&A, everything that was asked and answered will also go in the material, so you will have those as well. Thank you again, everyone, for your time, and we hope to see you next month for our next EM Geoforum series. Have a great day.